very much welcome to the GPCC Personal Centred Care Arena webinar today about personal centred care in Europe. I'm Joachim Mullén, professor in, at the, in nursing at the University of Gothenburg, and I'm a centre director for the GPCC, the University of Gothenburg Centre for Personal Centred Care. And uh, I'd like to give a few words as an introduction. Let me see. So the University of Gothenburg uh, Center for Personal Centric Care was established in 2010 with support from the Swedish government's strategic investment in health care research. And the overarching objective is to support and carry out high quality research related to personal centric care. And we, uh, the research is organized into three strategic focus areas according to the updated research program we're working with today. And that's the development, adaptation, and relation of person centered care, enable transitioning to person centered health care and care, and the development of partnerships between patient representatives, the general public, and healthcare organizations and decision making systems. And a special feature of our research from the very beginning have been to working to enable and facilitate utilization of the knowledge. And uh, we have, for example, contributed with an online learning tool to, uh, to collaboratively, uh, you know, develop your own and team oriented knowledge about personal centric care. And the name of this tool is Mutual Meetings. Another example is that uh, colleagues from our center chaired uh, the European Committee that led to an agreement on the European level of a standard for patient involvement in healthcare and minimum requirements for person centered care. But today we're going to listen to some research results from colleagues about uh, person centered care in Europe. And I would like to introduce uh, the moderator for this webinar, which is Margarita Haag, the chair of the Swedish Network Against Cancer, which is a national umbrella organization. And uh, she's also a patient partner to our center. So please welcome Margarita. Uh, I think you're still muted. So that's what the same for it's, me. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Joachim, for the introduction and for presenting the University of Gothenburg Center for Person-Centered Care. Uh, it's it's um, my pleasure and honor to be here today and to listen to the presentations from two very knowledgeable researchers in person-centered care. And one of those persons uh, is first Eric Karlström. Uh, he's a PhD and professor in healthcare policy and practices, and his research specializes in health and crisis management and policy. He's also an ass assistant professor in public administration and Eric is a nurse specialist in, in ambulance services and has more than 30 years experience in this field. He has worked as a manager in various healthcare organizations and is a researcher connected to the Center for Person-Centered Care at the University of Gothenburg. And Eric will talk about uh, two things, I think, of his articles, one of which is person-centered care in European countries, stakeholders, practitioners, and researchers' perspectives. And uh, it's very interesting, really, to, I have read the article and I'm impressed, uh, really, with um, the outcome and the result of this article, and that it actually can form a base for implementation of person-centered care in Europe. So please, Eric, you're very, very welcome, and please present your, your articles. Thank you, Margareta, for that introduction, and I am very glad to present those quite uh, newly accepted articles and published articles. Uh, I shall share a file um, so we all can see the PPT here, and I put it in. Okay. Uh, as Margareta said, it's two different uh, articles. One is uh, a literature review, and the other one is based on interviews with healthcare uh, staff in, in 27 European countries on micro, meso, and macro levels. 
macro levels is on, on government level and meso is normally on, on uh, uh, hospital level and micro level is with staff working with persons and care in, in practice. Um, and, and I take these, uh, the, the, the second one is accepted for publication in, in October and, and it will be published in the next few days. So it's, it's finalized in these days actually. Uh, so let's start with that one. The first one we uh, uh, scanned uh, uh, 23 European countries on literature. It was on scientific studies and also on grey literature, uh, mostly uh, public documents uh, concerning uh, person centered care. And, and we uh, search in, in Medline Scopus. Uh, in Sinal and Google, mostly for, for, for the public documents in, in Google. And, and uh, during this work, we group these countries based on, on healthcare systems. And in the end, uh, we chose 1194 documents that we included in the final study. Um, uh, it, it was uh, really a, a, s a severe, difficult search process because the Google documents was, were more than two, two and five millions documents that, that concerned persons and care. So, so it was a heavy, heavy, heavy uh, process to, to, to prioritize. And, and the, the three other is, is more normal uh, search results because that is, is uh, scientific articles. From medlines in all and, and scopus. And you can see the Prisma flow diagram here where we <coughs> have some help in, in, in the, the screening process uh, when, when we did this, this uh, project. Uh, you can see that we ended with uh, 1184 documents in the end. Uh, if we look here at the results, you can see on the right column, uh, the third figure, it's the part of all documents Villa. that are found. Uh, uh, the, the, the figure that is in percent. Uh, and that is, uh, then we have merged the, the, the scientific articles with, with the public documents. And uh, uh, where we found most research and, and public documents about person centered care was in the UK, England, Scotland, Wales, and North Ireland. Uh, actually, it represented more than 40% of all the documents in these, these countries. And if we uh, make a cutoff uh, on 2%, just above Italy, we have uh, eight uh, countries left. And we can see there that, that it's uh, UK, Sweden, uh, Netherlands, Ireland, Norway, Germany, Spain, and Denmark included. And then we started to understand that, that we had a dominance in certain healthcare systems, uh, especially those who we call beverage, which is uh, tax financed and, and public uh, healthcare. Uh, and and in, in Europe, we can, we can find a lot of person can care in those countries, but also in countries that has a heritage of the Bismarck system. Uh, and and if, if we look at that group, of, of eight countries, we find the Netherlands and Germany in that group. And, and Bismarck, as you probably know, it's, it's based on insurances, uh, often mandatory insurances, you know, that that's some part of your, your salary is, is paid in order to get health care. And, and uh, the, the insurance companies that you have chose, they buy health care from, from public health care providers or, or even uh, private health care providers. Um, we take the next article, because this was, was the groundwork. And, and uh, now we started to interview and, and we chose to, this time 27 countries. And why 27 countries? Why did we have more countries than, than in the review? It was to, to make, uh, to distribute uh, all, all the countries in even parts as much as possible. So we chose to, uh, five countries from Scandinavia, five from British Isles, five from the Mediterranean area, 
and from the former East Bloc. We, we interviewed in seven countries. But among those, uh, we, we found out that, that this was quite even because 11 was from the Bismarck system, 15 from, from the beverage system, and we had one country, Greek, that, that had more of a mixed model system. And in total, we performed 66 uh, interviews. And we asked uh, different types of questions. Um, some of the participants, when we asked the first question, if I say person-centered care, how would you define it? Some of them did, haven't heard the concept before. And, and uh, then the interview was uh, quite uh, poor after that, as you can, as you can understand. But, but most, most uh, participants, of course, could, could uh, uh, give some type of idea about person-centered care. And also, uh, uh, quite many of them could, could answer on, on uh, their country's roadmap on, on person-centered care. And um, uh, after that, decisions taken and, and also give some type of hint how it is implemented in the country. And we also added a, a question in the end about status of corruption, because the corruption indexes that we have uh, prepared with and, and read uh, was uh, mostly about public uh, services and not so specified on healthcare services. So it was, was important to ask that question. Uh, we had an analyzed tool. We used Rogers, Everett Rogers theoretical tool, uh, where he, uh, in a cautious way, points out knowledge, persuasion, decision, and then implementation in a diffusion process of innovations. And, and uh, that model has been criticized because uh, we have, have a, a lot of, of authors that have said that it's not so crucial, such a process is often quite interactive. So we had that in my mind when we used that model uh, in order to, to, uh, to distribute and sort in, in the data material. And, and I give you the, the results directly. So, so when we come to the first one, you know, knowledge on the top here. We found that uh, what I already told you, that beverage was dominant. In beverage countries, they were, person centered care was well known. And also in, in most of them, quite implemented. Quite implemented. Uh, while in, in, uh, in countries with statutory and health insurance, healthcare like Bismarck, it was not, not so represented as in Bismarck, as in, in beverage countries. And, and we, uh, uh, we elaborated that in the interview with, with, with the participants, and they told us that, that in Bismarck countries, we have a, a sort of, of uh, freedom to make choices, actually, because we chose between these uh, insurance companies, for example, and we can also, in, in a way, control what type of, of healthcare providers we want in the end. And, and uh, we feel that we have perceived freedom or, or some type of equity in the provision of healthcare. While in, in the beverage countries, we had a long, long, long tradition of a monopoly in the healthcare industry. And uh, we could, could also uh, 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 see that, that, the, that, that the healthcare industry had been or was uh, criticized because of former hierarchical and authoritative healthcare, uh, and, and that sometimes tend to continue. So, so it, it was, was connected to, to a lack of freedom. And we also learned that uh, some type of healthcare is, is uh, person-centered care uh, more represented than in other types of healthcare. Uh, so we said in slow healthcare, there's a lot of person-centered care, but in fast healthcare, fast types of healthcare, uh, it's often lack. So we found it in geriatrics, psychiatrics and pediatrics, but not much in, in um, emergency care. And, and uh, uh, a contrast is that patient-centered tradition often were present in emergency care. But, but not yet uh, person-centered care traditions when we asked the, the, the participants. Uh, when we come to decision, the, the, the next bullet point in, in, uh, in Rogers uh, theoretical model, uh, we find that, that facilitators was, uh, for example, 
regulations that, that encourage its uh, PCC. And of course, also political decisions made to, to improve the quality in healthcare and also improve the status uh, of, of the patient within the healthcare industry, within the healthcare sector. And especially when, when resources were allocated to fulfill such message, missions. Uh, for example, campaigns such as What Matters to You that, that have uh, continued in, in Great Britain, for example, have had, uh, as they told us, a great impact uh, and, and was, was very, very efficient, according to, to, to some of, of the participants. Uh, when, we, when we still look at decision and, and uh, find out what are, are, are seem to be hinders in the diffusion of person-centered care, it's, of course, the opposite, lack of regulations forcing the healthcare industry to adopt PCC. And, and uh, uh, one thing that, that was pointed out as a problem was uh, countries who often produce soft decision documents. That is quite, quite uh, uh, common in, in Scandinavian countries, and, and especially in Sweden, we are criticized about for that. And, and I think Ulrika will, will give us more information about it a little later. Um, and also, uh, when, when the healthcare sector is fragmented in different types of fragmentation, for example, that we have a political, strong political decision levels on the municipality level, uh, on, on the county council level, then on the state level. Uh, and and uh, those levels uh, uh, are, are, are fragmented also in the political view, for example. It can be, be difficult to... to uh, to uh, have, have a, a diffusion of, of persons at the care. Uh, implementation. Uh, uh, here, here we have, have something that was quite interesting. Uh, and, and we uh, 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 directly, uh, we uh, co uh, connected to, to, uh, to uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, power distance concept, the uh, power distance concept uh, about uh, adhocracy versus ad uh, autocracy and, and, and uh, uh, non bureaucratic culture versus very bureaucratic cult culture. Uh, and that was very, very obvious when, when one, one of our uh, uh, participants, a professor uh, in, in Malta, told us uh, that we here in Malta, we have a totally other uh, culture than, than you have in Scandinavia or, or they have in, in, in British countries because we are more bureaucratic in our culture. We have a how power, power distance. So if I meet a patient and if I say, now we have uh, two or three third certain uh, um, uh, 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 and, and, and different possibilities for you to choose. Uh, uh, they probably will answer, I will not take that choice because I'm a carpenter. You are the professor and the physician, so you have to choose for me. Uh, while in, in countries like, like Great Britain, according to this professor and, and Scandinavia, it was much easier to, to, to uh, suggest something like, like different choices. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, according to him, we were more eager to have that discussion. Uh, so, so this was something that divided countries, for example, around the Mediterranean area and, and, uh, and uh, countries uh, like Great Britain, in Great Britain, uh, Ireland and, and Scandinavian countries. Uh, still implementation of facilitators. Uh, we can see that long traditions of civil rights in healthcare sector had a, a, a positive effect on the implementation of, of person-centered care. For example, Netherlands had a heritage of, uh, uh, of uh, insurance-based healthcare, but still they were very, very strong in research, but also in public documents. And they also had uh, in most uh, type of healthcare settings like hospitals, they were patient boards and they have had that for, for years actually. And, and the, 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 the participants said that that is because of, of a long tradition of civil rights in this country, for example. Uh, 
And, and patient unions, unions who monitored the diffusion of PCC were also facilitators of, of spreading out the, the PCC. And, and Hinders, uh, on the other hand, was, uh, uh, for example, staff uh, uh, claiming that PCC is already practiced, some type of perceived freedom and equity in the provision of healthcare. And corruption was, of course, a, a, a huge hinder. We know that, that when, when uh, uh, we have corruption, it's also very, very difficult to make changes and, and implement new, new uh, uh, models. So uh, that was Rogers' theoretical tole, the interactive process of causality and and this uh, uh, schema is uh, this this uh, shadow is is based on on this second article that is qualitative and we made interviews uh, and we can see that we have these beverage countries in the top of high degree of person centers and, and low degree of public a high also a high degree of public control the lower axis is moving from, from a high degree of public control to a low degree of public control with corruption in, in one end and the, the beverage, the tax financed uh, public health care in the other end. And, and uh, these uh, uh, factors coincide and, and we can find these countries uh, as a cluster in the top. But in all, we can find four different cl clusters from, from this study uh, where we have beverage countries, but with a high degree of poverty distance based on Hofstede's findings during the 80s. Uh, Malta, Italy, Spain and Portugal, uh, countries around the Mediterranean and, and ha having another culture than in, in British countries and, and Scandinavia. And, um, and we also find Bismarck countries in, in, in a cluster where uh, the uh, 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 Bismarck model uh, dominates. And then we have uh, management control difficulties in the last cluster with, with, with countries that, for example, uh, have, have still have problem to, to find a, way to, to organize the healthcare system in post uh, Soshenko cultures, cultures, uh, countries, for example, where they have had still uh, yet a very, very short period to develop their own healthcare in these countries and they are still searching for, for, for their way to, to, uh, uh, to, to manage the health industry. So that was the main results from these two studies. Thank you very much, Eric, for this presentation. It's very interesting to see uh, the difference in the various countries. And we will discuss later about how can we actually help the, the smart countries and how if we have implemented uh, or decided we have, we have a decision, a European decision on minimum involvement of patient uh, centered care. So um, we would like that to move on. Uh, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will uh, raise them after the presentations and go on, just write in the chat there, all your comments and your questions. And I would like then to thank you, Eric, and we'll come back to you and now introduce Ulrika. Ulrika Wienblad is our next, next uh, presenter, presenter and she's a PhD. Uh, uh, and a Swedish Harkness Fellow in Healthcare Policy and Practice, and is a professor in Health Services Research at the Department of Public Health and Caring Sciences at Uppsala University. She is also the Director of the Health Services Research Group at Uppsala University. And Ulrika received her PhD in Health Services Research from Uppsala University. And Ulrika has um, specialized in this article about the national and regional governance of person-centered care in Sweden. And it's very interesting to see the different um, perspectives of Sweden and the one, the article you just presented, Eric. So please, Ulrika, take uh, the stage and, and uh, welcome. 
Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, and I'll try to share my, okay. Share my slides here. Good. Can you see, let's see. Uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so my name is Ulrika Wimblod, uh, and I'm as, uh, was said, I'm a professor in health science research at Uppsala University. And it's a great pleasure to be here today and present our, our results from this study that we've conducted for the last three years, and the study that is funded by DPCC. Uh, and to start with today, most research about person-centered care is conducted at the clinical level. And in this project, we have taken a part a different approach by focusing more on the regional and national level, so to say. Uh, and as we see, there is a lack of systematic knowledge regarding how regional management and governance contribute to person centered care. For instance, re about reimbursement systems, the regulations, education information, but also in the actual evaluation, for instance, about indicators of follow up activities. Uh, and this uh, approach is kind of, it's particularly interesting to investigate since person centered care in a multi level governance system like the Swedish is a bit complicated. And for our international participants, I have two pictures here about where I describe briefly the Swedish healthcare system. And as Erik Karlsson said, the Swedish system is a typical beverage healthcare system based on the principles of the universities, social equality, and public planning. And it is also a multi-level political system with three different levels um, where we have directly elected political politicians at state level, regional level, and municipal level. Uh, and the national uh, uh, region, the, the national government, um, is, sort of say, is in charge uh, about, uh, about the funding but, and also the legal, the, the legal parts of the system where the Health and Medical Service Act is the most um, important act in the, um, so, so, so the frame for the services. Still, the Swedish system is highly decentralized. I think it's one of the Europe's most decentralized system where services are provided, so to say, by the 21 regions. Uh, and they are responsible for both provision and the funding of, of healthcare services with direct elected uh, politicians and also a right to actually level income taxes, which gives them a strong autonom autonomy. Uh, still, the national government ha has some ways of, of actually steering the lower levels in the system, and they steer through different policy instruments, um, financial instruments, legal instruments, and informative instruments. And we used to call it carrots, sticks, and sermons. Uh, and historically though, uh, we've had a very consensus-based system in Sweden that is built more on dialogue between the national government and an interesting organization called Salar that is representing all the different regions and the municipalities. And we've seen a shift later to, towards a more centralized and a more standardized governance model, which puts more focus, on, say, on, on the national level. And so that was kind of the background to our study. Uh, in our actual study then, we investigated um, how the national governance of personal standard care is organized and conducted, both on the national level and on the regional level, and how the national government, so to say, and the regions facilitate the implementation of, of different activities uh, regarding patient-centered care. And so far, we, we conducted two sub-studies, one on the national level and one on the regional level. Uh, and we've looked, one is more a documentary study where we looked uh, into the period of between 2015 and 2021. Uh, and we've done loads of documentary analysis of, of uh, national inquiries, white papers, reports, a lot of gray literature, different uh, bills and so on. And then we've added 36 interviews on both the national level and also with the regional representatives uh, in four different regions in different parts of the country. Uh, and we uh, used an uh, analytical model by uh, Kieran Walsh, um, and we used his model so to, say, to analyze the steering process, where we look into the, the regulatory goals, so the purpose of the regulations and how clear and explicitly the goals are. 
We also look into the scope of regulations, uh, which organizations are so, sort of subject to the regulations and what activities within those organizations are regulated. Um, and we also look into the more, more of the methods to a deterrence or compliance. Um, is it a soft or a hard steering model, so to say? Uh, and also the methods used to measure the performance uh, and if there are any sanctions uh, towards bad implementation. Uh, we've also looked into the methods to communicate the very little requirements. I won't talk so much about that part of the model today, though. Uh, anyway, going into the results, um, uh, in most of the documents and also in the interviews, we found an increased and broad support for the concept of, of person-centered care. And there is a change over time, uh, a more a direction to uh, the, the a direction towards a more person-centered care has been accentuated very clearly, both on the national and the regional level. Even though we wouldn't say that there is any general definition of the concept, uh, it's more highlighted as an approach or an ethics, or say, not an individual reform. And that could, of course, be a bit problematic when it comes to the actual implementation. And there is no si single, uh, sort of say, person centered care reform. Uh, and it's very obvious to us, uh, that person centered care has been considered both as a goal per se and but also as a means to reach other goals such as efficiency equity or access or other types of goals so it's both a goal and a means uh, and notable is also that person centered care is more and more highlighted as a part of the ongoing transfer uh, to good and close care, what in Swedish is called nära vård. It has sort of say, been included in that concept. Uh, looking into the scope of regulation, um, there's, no, as I said, no particular law or regulation about person-centered care, but the national government has decided on some more specific measures. Um, overall, though, it's very clear to us that the national governments can be described as soft, exactly as, as Eric said in his previous presentation, uh, where there's a clear focus on dialogue and dissemination of knowledge as a way to create leg legitimacy for the actual um, reform. And a great deal of space is given to the counties themselves or the readers themselves to decide on what activities to promote. Uh, and that is, of course, both a plus and a minus. Um, it's not very detailed exactly what the readers need to do. Uh, and also there's very weak follow-up. Um, and so far, with the lack of appropriate methods and indicators that actually could steer or, or help uh, follow up the activities. And there's also no sanctions for non-compliance. It's interesting that the last years we see that there's been a uh, clear uh, three type of in national initiated measures that are particularly emphasized on the national level. And those are the patient contracts. It's kind of a joint agreement between the patient and the care provider um, with the patient as a starting point, so to say. Uh, it's also something called assigned uh, general practitioner and standardized care pathways. Uh, and it's very interesting to see that where I come back to that later in the readers, some of them have taken up uh, on these measures and some have not. Uh, we, I would say that that particular the patent contract where we have discussed this in, in the readers, we see a, quite a lot of resistance actually to, to the way uh, they don't think it's actually necessary this way. It's too difficult, in particular, the men of the physicians mean that we we don't need this kind of, of, of contract to, to, to actually, they want to emphasize different other things. And when it comes to signed general practitioner, the, the national goal now is that 55% of the patients should have a, 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 a signed general practitioner. We haven't come that far yet. Uh, at the moment, there is a, a shortage of, 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 of general practitioners within the healthcare system. It's very difficult to create this kind of continuity within the system. Uh, yes, going then to the regional level, how, how have they adapted to this national steering? What is it that we can see? And as I said before, 
if we've gone through all documents for almost all of the regions, not only these four, but all when it comes to looking into how they kind of um, how they've emphasized the the, the cost for patient centeredness or person centeredness. And we looked into the years 2019 and 2021. And it's amazing to see how that almost all of the regions in their steering documents have a quite long descriptions and, and mentioned the concept um, in a much more thorough way than they did just a couple of years ago. We did a comparison with two, I think it was 2015 or maybe 2016. Uh, um, anyway, few of the regions have developed their own definition of the concept. They actually use DPCC's definition or other types of definition from other, of, there's also from another authority. Uh, and particular uh, and precisely in the same way as on the national level, they considered uh, they consider person centered care as both a goal and a means to develop healthcare services, which is quite interesting to see within the same text. You see these different ways of, of framing the concept, and also it's closely connected, particularly in the last two years, to the development of good and close care. So kind of the concept of person centered care, care have kind of been included within the discussion of, of good and close care. Uh, very much soft governance, even at this level, uh, no plan in many uh, regions exactly what to do. It's a lot of let a thousand flowers bloom with many local projects. Some of them seem to be quite successful, mobile teams, care coordinators, new type of care centers, uh, very ambitious initiatives in, in many cases. Uh, we haven't seen really any evaluations yet but a lot of enthusiasm and, and um, different projects uh, some of the regions not all have also implemented patient contracts assigned dp and standardized car care pathways um, it looks a bit different um, and um, uh, also some of, of the regions sort of say support uh, and and try to structure the implementation of these activities in the form of information training, uh, even though local bottom-up initiatives still seem to be most decisive here in, in this process. Uh, as I said before, the work with parasitic care is clearly connected to the development of good and close care. And of course, the advantage here is that the work makes the work concrete and you know what to do. The, the backside of it is that the development is mostly focused around primary care. Personal centered care is much more than primary care and, and not a board. Um, and we, we can come back to that later if, it's, if this is good or not. Um, few regions, hardly any, have developed economic incentives to support personal centered care. Um, it's not sort of say included in the reimbursement systems in, in any way, at least when we did our study. Uh, uh, also, it's been quite difficult to obtain a comprehensive picture exactly which activities are conducted and what their outcomes are. Uh, I think that's something that is very important in, in the future to actually find a way to evaluate these activities. And evaluations of, of the person the party is already done and no sanctions have been done so far. Uh, Anyway, so to summarize, uh, it seems to be a strong agreement on both national and regional level that healthcare services need to become more person-centered. And we see that in the documents, we see that in, in the interviews, a very clear sort of say consensus around that, which is positive. And we also see increased engagement, both at the national and the regional level, even though it seems to be more of an ethical approach than a clear political reform. Uh, and also mix of goals and means. Um, still, we, we consider the steering from the national level to be quite unclear. It's as it is in the Swedish case, mostly soft governance, which makes it a bit difficult for the readers to actually understand what, it, what is expected of them. Uh, and it's also hard to get a grasp of what is done. Uh, and especially no sanctions are, are for failed implementation. And it's also risk. Uh, that the reform of good and close care sort of say takes over where there's most focus on, on primary care uh, and less focus on the personal centered parts of, of the services. 
Uh, and I also have, we have some recommendations um, for both the national and the regional level, which could be good to maybe problematize the purpose of the reform or, or the whole intention behind the reform, why is person centered care important on, on the meso and macro level, and, and is it something distinct from good and close care? And maybe put a word structure the implementation of the reform in, in another way uh, to make it a bit clearer what, what is expected from the providers to actually and, and how can they be helped um, through a more dedicated leadership, for instance, focus more on person centered care. And of course, improved evaluation. Uh, we think that is key to, to further development. Um, uh, and there's also a demand for more frequent and more operational follow up based on more qualitative methods in that sense. So that was my last picture. And I would like to thank our participants for very good interviews. And also I'd like to thank GPCC for generous funding. Uh, and so far we have published one book chapter, uh, two working reports, and we have two papers that are not uh, uh, published yet. Good, that was my last slide. Thank you very much, Ulrika, and thank you for telling us about the future uh, future uh, articles that you will publish concerning mm -hmm. this matter. And uh, as a Swede, I can uh, strongly agree with you about the national governance and the problems with having a national mm -hmm. and a regional and a local governance. Uh, and I know that many regions have actually now politically decided that they should have a person-centered care in the region, but uh, most um, caregivers do not know it. They are not informed and they are not aware and they can't really see the importance either sometimes. So I think it's very, very important to, to, uh, to evaluate and to inform the caregivers and the politicians why it is important. And there is a lot of research done, and I know that UPCC has, it, has the answers on some of these uh, uh, questions, and, and that should be publicized, I think, all over the place. And especially as we do have, we do have a standard in Sweden, and also the one taken in, in Europe. So uh, we should try and help all, all countries to, um, to implement person-centered care because it is important. And it's important for the quality for patients and it's also important for reducing the costs and making the, the care more efficient. Uh, and I think it's, um, oh, it's very important. And it's interesting to see the differences between Sweden and Europe. And I know that the Swedish system is really complicated and uh, with these 21 regions adapting national decisions, make it really, really difficult for everybody in concern, caregivers and, and academy and patients also. So thank you very, very much. And uh, I would like you now, if I don't see any questions in the chat, so please raise your hand and say that you would, uh, and you know, on reactions, you can raise your hand and ask questions or comment to these two, um, wonderful presentations and the first one i see is Lars Wallin. Mm -hmm. welcome oh thank you very much it was really nice to listen to you both uh, and i've known about these studies for for a while and it's really uh, really fine to see <coughs> outcomes presented now uh, i i have a, a couple of ref reflections one one to eric and <coughs> one to Erika. Uh, Eric, I thought it was really nice to see that you're using diffusion of innovation to sort up your data. It's, it's not every day that, that you see that coming coming to use today. So that, that, and I think it worked out well for, for, from your presentation. But what I wonder primarily is about your data collection. As I remember, you, you were interviewing two, three, four people at, in each country on different levels in, in, in the systems. Uh, and how, how, how sort of colored is their perception from, 
Mm. And, uh, my, my question, I think, simple is how valid is data mm. because of, of, of that approach? Mm. Of course, this is a qualitative study and, and it points in, in a direction. Uh, it is hard to, to, to uh, take it too far. For, but we started with, with a literature overview. Uh, and, and the literature overview, Queen's, Queen's, uh, they overlap each other, these two studies, mm -hmm. and, and point in the same direction, actually. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we can we can see that where we have a lot of uh, publications, uh, ongoing research, uh, public documents, uh, these are those countries that we pointed out, those mm -hmm. beverage countries. Uh, mm -hmm. And we can also see, see some differences between the rest of them under the two percent level or, or the cutoff uh, level but it's very very difficult so so i i, I would uh, ask for more studies more studies and broader studies mm -hmm. uh, where we we uh, of course uh, use these ids that we have presented here and that points in a certain direction but 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 uh, g give it more more uh, power to to to, uh, to to see what what, what we find mm -hmm. out yes um, Thank, thank you, Eric. Yes, I understand your your data, your findings make sense, and also mm -hmm. your reasoning. And Ulrika, to you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, two two reflections. The, uh, this um, you know, this standardized standardized pathways, which is sort of is a combo of of, of standardization and mm -hmm. individualization. Yes. Have you got any idea about how that is working in 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 the Swedish health system? Mm -hmm. Because it's a it's a little strange combination, yes, I think. It is. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, then, and then one one more thing, uh, uh, and uh, I can really understand that it was difficult to get really a, a deeper understanding of what's going on in the regions. You, mm -hmm. you said that it was uh, no evaluations and really understand difficult to understand what they what, what kind of activities they had and and I, I can understand that completely well after we we, we have done a study here in region Dalarna on, on just what 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 is done and how have they done it and and you, you, we needed to do a lot of interviews and, and document to really get an understanding of that so I think that is really difficult material to dig into it requires a lot of resources but, and it's not really open it's not th anything that the regions are, are sort of marketing for themselves which 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 i think they should do in, in greater extent than what they actually are doing mm -hmm. okay thank you thank you i can start with the second question i, I totally agree it, it is very difficult to to get a grasp of what, about what is going on and there are, lot, there are a lot of pilots, there are a lot of projects that kind of say live a short while and then it dies, uh, and a lot of learning that disappear. I'm quite critical actually to this project model in Sweden that is taking place, which is an effect of our multi-level weak soft governance model. Uh, it's the learning aspect is, is, is weak, according to, to me. Um, so yeah, I guess I, can, I don't know if I can say more about that. Uh, when it comes to standardized pathways, it was mentioned. Uh, it's supposed to be there. I don't know actually how well it's going. It seems to be going better within the cancer areas. Uh, they have long tradition that had nothing to do, sort of say, with person-centered care to start with. It was it's another development, sort of say, that was linked into the person-centered uh, idea. Um, so I, I'm not the right person uh, to answer that question, even though there were some of our interviews that actually problematized it a bit and said, is this, it's standardized care, how could this be person centered care? Mm. So at, at least they, they saw the, the, the conflict there. Mm. Thank you. Uh, can I can I just come in there say, as I'm uh, working a lot with cancer yes. and, and in the... Um, guidelines the various guidelines for diagnosis and cancer rehabilitation since then you we are sitting and updating the national um, program for for cancer rehabilitation mm -hmm. and finally finally it's there it says that it should be a person-centered care mm -hmm. in rehabilitation and we are pushing it into every guideline but it takes time and the guideline may be there but you have to live up to it as well. 
mm-hmm. and in all the 21 regions and that will take another 10 years i think mm-hmm. but but at least the thoughts are there mm-hmm. uh, and and if the thoughts are there maybe the culture will follow afterwards so that's what we're hoping for right. uh, so thank you Lars for your very important questions and you Akim, will you take over and and um and ask John to do something. I don't know if you guys John. <laughs> John Chaplin next to pose a question. Okay, thank you. Uh thank you both for very interesting presentations. Um I can follow Lash's example and have a question to both of you. Um to to Eric, um what I was interested to know was and, and Margareta mentioned uh, sort of the drivers for for Im- implementing uh, patient centered care as being both increasing efficiency and reducing costs. And I wondered whether you'd got any picture from the interviews that you've done. What is it that is actually driving uh, the progress towards person-centered care in in Europe in these different countries? If you boil this down, I think it's it's a long civil rights tradition. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I also think that the, the patient unions monitoring the healthcare is very, very important. So, 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 so if we boil this down, it's from the consumers of healthcare need to, to have more influence in their own care and, and in a loud way, you know, in debate articles uh, that they or, or, or in the national debate about healthcare systems and, and how it works. And, and th- there is, of course, a difference depends on the culture that, that the countries represent, because we, ha- we have different cultures. And, and, uh, and, and uh, in, some com- in some countries, we will be more, uh, more influence in the processes. And in other countries, we, we rely more maybe on, on, on the specialists and the professionals. And it can can also differ between between countries. Uh, so so I, I think that that this I think this could be the core part actually, rather than uh, than uh, monetary reasons, for example. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know we have had a lot of of studies in, in the GPCC, for example, about the efficiency of person-centered care and, and the outcome and cost of person-centered care, but. And that's very, very important, important studies and important results, I, I think, and, and good arguments also. But, but if you boil it down, I, I think it's something else. It, it's, it's about uh, uh, the equity, equity uh, question. Okay. Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I would also agree that reducing costs argument is, doesn't, doesn't seem very persuasive uh, yeah. uh, to, to most healthcare systems. Um, if I turn to Ulrika, then the uh, what I work with is patient reported outcomes, and mm-hmm. I've worked a lot with uh, the quality registries, mm-hmm. and I and I've got the impression that regionally um, there has been a push to increase the use of person uh, person reported outcomes, which yeah. I see as a lead into mm-hmm. person centered care. Um, they uh, the Salar has used more of a, a, a carrot approach than than sanctions mm-hmm. offering. Uh, additional funding if quality registries uh, mm. start to use person reporting mm. outcomes. But that seems to be now drawing back um, uh, from that, that funding. And I just wondered whether you'd picked up any yeah. uh, issues around that or, or, or whether you had any comments on that. No, no, but I mean, yeah, I fully agree. Some of the quality registries work very hard with the CROMs, uh, patient report outcomes, but that doesn't seem to inform the political decisions in the regions in a very clear way. It is very um, unfortunate. They could, I mean, the, polit- the politicians could make use of the quality register data in a much more thorough way that, than they do today. They use what we call the open comparisons that comes every year. But they hardly use direct data from the registers. There needs to be much better communication here between the registry holders and and the healthcare actually and, and the, the administrative political level to actually make use of of, uh, of on, on on data in real time, sort of say, real time data, right. uh, where they could make use of, of much of the prompt data and stuff, or and also other reports that are there. So there is data about patient reported outcomes. <laughs> but it's not used in, in a particular structured way. 
So maybe the quality registries have got to be encouraged to... Definitely. Uh, yeah, we had a study a couple of years ago that was valid about that, where we looked into how the, the readers actually made use of the data. And the data was mainly used on the clinical level within the clinics for quality improvement work, but rarely on the kind of macro uh, political level. Right. They used the data, but in another way. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, interesting. The, the okay. aggregated data that came was presented once a year. Right, yeah, in their report. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Next to post questions is Philippa Ventura. You're welcome. Hi. Uh, hi, Eric. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, thank you both, Eric and Rike, for the, the, the nice presentations. It's really nice to see the results. And thank you to GPCC for organizing these opportunities. It's really good for us, the others in from the other countries, <laughs> to to get in touch with the, with what we want to have in our country. And I'm not I'm from Portugal. I'm not alone here from Portugal. Claudia is here as well. Um, and so I think I have some comments um, uh, just to say first, and then and then a question. Um, the comments go a little bit, a little, a little bit towards what uh, Eric presented, and uh, the 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 issue of or not the issue, but the 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 culture aspect and uh, uh, the way we are used to participate uh, in in processes that regard our health as citizens uh, in Portugal, maybe. Um, and and also what uh, John said about reducing costs. Uh, I usually start with that uh, because that's that's a very uh, well when I'm talking about person-centered care and what we have to to win with it. I usually start with that because here in Portugal it still has the greatest impact, I think. Um, and we are actually uh, here at uh, our unit trying to uh, we started a review uh, similar to what Ulrike uh, has. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I hope, and I will, I will really try to see uh, the chapter, look after your chapter, the one that you wrote, because uh, we started to look what, what, what exists from the regulatory point of view, mm -hmm. uh, guiding our persons, well, well, guiding us healthcare professionals to implement person-centered care. Um, and unfortunately, what I what I know so far and what what we've grasped is, for instance, our starting with the the system that we use to evaluate uh, the quality of care uh, by each, each institution, which is called the CINAS. Uh, it's it doesn't it doesn't have it doesn't take into account the health well the perspective of the patient or service user or client. Um, so it's it's self-reported by the healthcare professionals at its, each institution. And that says a lot about how we can, well, so far how we have considered the perspective of the persons that use the service, um, right, compared to the pers perspective of the persons who provide, provide care. So that's one comment. Then the standardized care pathways, I think it's like, having worked with cancer in Sweden uh, cool. and trying to implement uh, person-centered oncology nursing here in, cool. in, in, in Portugal, I really recognize the value of having the grounds of a standardized care pathway to, to go further and try to, to make it person-centered. Of course, we have to have the, the ethics of person-centered in mind all the time, and, and it's, it's present, and I see it, but then if you want to to establish something like a um, NERA board, so establish something like um, an integrated care uh, pathway for the person that may to avoid the person that lives like six hours away from here, from the city to come to the city to, to just maybe to, for self-management of, of a symptom or self-management support, then the existence of the standardized care pathway is really, it's really, it's it's the, it's a ground to, 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 to prompt other uh, tailored interventions and, and attending to the person um, regardless of that, well, not regardless, but taking into to account the resources uh, independent of the fragilities. And my question is then, um, <laughs> because we do have to come to the question, um, uh, the standard, the, the, the CNTC, 
the Corona 50. I know that it was supposed to be implemented by whole state members until the end of 2020, and then the pandemic came and, and everything got delayed. So I know that it's not in action here in Portugal. I have been in contact with uh, our uh, regulatory entity for the healthcare system. So what can we do in our countries to help you, <laughs> to help us to implement the standard? <laughs> what are your suggestions? How can we start? That was a tricky one. <laughs> what is that, Eric? <laughs> no answer. I, I have been, so in, in our studies, what we have been trying to do is to, to use it, you know, just trying to disseminate it, but, you know, it's, it still feels like it's bottom up. Mm. Uh, so how do we reach the top? Mm. I think if I start, I think people have to be more aware of the standard. Uh, I'd say that at least on the regional level, um, many people are not even aware that it exists so far, um, unfortunately. Uh, and then be able to kind of understand what it means and also have resources to implement it. So it's three things. Know that it's there, resources to implement it, but also knowledge about how to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Lika. Thank you. Uh, may I just um, mention that I'm a part of a research group with uh, uh, researchers from, from uh, Karolinska Institute, Biobank Sweden, ATMP Sweden, and some patient representatives mm -hmm. from Bra the Brain um, Association and for rare diseases and for um, professional uh, patients, I think they call lead patients. Mm -hmm. And we've actually published a report on, um, on patient co-creation, uh, patient and next of kin co-creation for better research and healthcare. And we only have it in Swedish, um, unfortunately, but uh, we hope to be financed to, to translate it into English because many people have actually asked for it. And uh, we, we hope that we will receive some funding for that. Uh, and that, and we feel that that is really uh, good for healthcare, the healthcare system and for patients also, because they, they need also to know how to talk with the healthcare providers and with the researchers and with politicians and authorities. Mm -hmm. So it's sort, of a, it's sort of a training and education, but it's also guidelines how you can actually implement this and do it from the very start in the project. Mm -hmm. So I can, I, I can send it. I know that GPCC, you will have it somewhere uh, there. And uh, once it is uh, translated, we hope that it can be used well in Europe. Mm -hmm. And now you are can you have yes. Yeah, so there are at least two qu questions. And first, yes. Mildred Lundgren, you're welcome. Hi, Mildred Lundgren. I'm representing HHT, which is a rare disease, and I'm a, I'm um, a patient advocate um, in this organisation. And also, we have cystic fibrosis in our family, also. But I'm not involved in the patient association. So I was happy to hear Margareta bring in rare diseases there. Just one of the things that was on my mind. Uh, the presentations are excellent. I really enjoyed the presentations, and I'm going to use the content in in my advocacy work in mobilizing patients. You know, that's the success factor that you said. Patients need to be mobilized and um, and to take responsibility for their health, and not just their sickness, but their their health. And um, but the what what disturbs me recently or currently what's happening um, with um, some patients for, for some rare diseases because of the structure of the responsibility of funding in Sweden, where regions are responsible for the funding mm -hmm. and you have cystic fibrosis patients, you know, not many, but some of them moving to Denmark and other countries mm -hmm. and also accessing medication from countries like Norway black market type medication one patient gets med medication in norway they mm -hmm. don't need to use the whole of it so they come back and then they share the medication yeah. with swedish patients i mean all of that is just did that come up and are we going to see 
at national level, more of responsibility there for our funding, especially for rare diseases. Mm -hmm. uh, in our study, it was not discussed at all um, on that level, so to say. Uh, but but I, I mean, the issue is very, very, it's a kind of very important question. Here. And we hear it from in other studies that we conduct at the moment. This issue comes up all the time with, with especially about expensive uh, drugs uh, that are, could not be used uh, in some of the regions and in others, it's differences between the regions as well, but particularly in Sweden compared to other countries where, where people travel actually, even to South America for, for cystic fibrosis medication, for instance, that it's not approved here um, within our system. I don't know, Eric, if you had more to add on that question. Uh, no, no, I can't, can't add anything. I can just, just verify that this is a huge problem. And, and mm. Differences between so very similar countries, yeah. like Norway, Sweden, Denmark, mm. is, is a huge problem that we should have some type of coordination mm. uh, of, of these issues in order to make it uh, uh, make, make a safer situation for the patients. So, so uh, it, it lacks coordination in, in, in uh, issues that probably is not very, very difficult to sort out. Mm. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. I think it's also interesting with the same type of, of medication to compare the, the the rationale behind the different decisions. Since these are partly political decisions and two so similar countries, why do they come to the different decision according to the same kind of medication? It's very interesting, actually. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Jonna Berholtz in, in the chat. So, could an incentive for implementing person centered care be healthcare staff satisfaction with the work? And there's data that healthcare staff is more likely to stay in the job when they ca can work more person centered. So, is there any data that it reduces ethical stress? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I did put a comment in the I did reply to that. Yes, so you have your comment. <laughs> yeah. Please, perfect. Yeah. We give so, a speech uh, to you, John. Yeah. So, so there is some evidence that, um, in fact, it could uh, per, per, implementation of person-centered care could yes. increase job strain uh, because it's a, a additional work that uh, needs to be done by the by the staff, but that it, it decreases the. The, the moral stress that uh, our, our personnel feel about how they deal with with uh, patients. So it's it's both, but it's it's not quite as clear cut as no. we might have hoped that it would be. Yeah. Um, but that's one study. I think there are other studies uh, related to job strain as well, which uh, I'm not so familiar with. I think it's an extremely interesting question, actually. I'm glad that you gave us an example here. Mm -hmm. And I would, please send me those studies if there are more of them. I don't have any answers, but I'm very interested in the question. And I think also we have ongoing studies on this issue. So, okay. so we will know more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we do. We had colleagues who had just recently received funding for that from a oh. national funder about PCC at work. Okay. And I believe that colleagues in Umeå have these kind of results about moral distress in in, in the context of, of elderly care. Elderly care, that's true. Yes, I'm on those. Yeah, that's I see right. Inger Hekman has a hand. Please add to this, Inger. Uh, thank you, Joachim. Uh, I agree with uh, John Chapman's... Uh... Oh, you can't. I can't hear you. You are muted. You became muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought my I just showed my video and thought that was enough. Sorry. Uh, I agree with John's comment, uh, but I just want to add also that we've seen in a review we've done on on uh, on uh, per, uh, personnel staffs experiences of in implementing person centered care that the, it was a bigger workload. But at the same time, uh, their intentions to leave their job, job mm -hmm. rotation from registered nurses decreased. So that is an indication of that you, well, you, e even though you uh, see a bigger workload, you, you like to stay a bit more mm -hmm. and, and work with it. It was just to compliment mm -hmm. the previous comment. Thank you. Thank you, great. Um, and Joachim, may I ask you, uh, the slides, the presentations we have seen, 
of course, everybody will receive them. Yeah. Isn't that can, correct? Yes. Yeah, we, we can send them uh, to the email addresses that you yeah. entered when you signed up for the webinar. Thank okay. you. That's good. Any other questions? Um, yeah. So then I take a, a chance with a question I was uh, triggered uh, with these presentations and the discussions and considering the differences in healthcare systems and cultures that you have dis kind of displayed today. So to what degree are person-centered care working experience and results uh, and outcomes comparable across different countries? You, Kim, you asked all of us, I, I believe, or, or you didn't address me on, on that. Well, I, you, you and, and Ulrika are welcome to start, if you'd like to um, yeah. propose anyone. Okay. Uh, of course, we have, have a lot of similarities, but there are differences. And I think uh, there is a huge difference between the, the beverage part and, and the Bismarck part. But we also have mixed modal. Uh, and and if, if some countries are in their... Uh, early stages of developing a healthcare system. And I think it's tough for them to be very, very person-centered care mindness before they see the structure of the system. So I think they need a lot of help. And, and, and I, I think that is uh, primarily the former Eastern, Eastern uh, countries. They, they struggle, struggle with, with a lot of difficulties and, and also with corruption within the healthcare system. Uh, uh, other countries in, in Europe, I, I think it, it's a slow adoption process. Uh, also in countries that is, is beverage countries and, and also around the Mediterranean. Uh, and we will see a development. I, 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 if we follow, for example, uh, uh, world value indexes, we see that, that uh, culture is, is moving and changing in the world in the slow, slow process. And we can see that from, from European studies also. So, so I think uh, the patient want more influence in all Europe, but it will take some time. Uh, and one thing that is, is important is, is the, the patient organizations that they are active and, and are, are represented in all those countries and also are given influence but, but that's I, I think that's a very very important start thank you eric as, as a representative of patient organizations I, I know that we need to push forward all these issues to actually achieve uh, better care and um, patient co-creation and a person-centered care it has to be worked on all levels, really, not only from the politicians, but also downwards and up. So it's um, it's very important and difficult, I would say. So thank you very much, all of you who have actually taken your time. And thank you, Ulrika and Eric, for doing a great job. And I'm sure that you will continue to do that. And that we all have to try and implement person-centered care wherever we are, it can be Portugal or Sweden or Norway or whatever. We will do our best, I'm sure. So you are keen, it's up to you now to just to close this session. Thank you much. For, uh, thanks first to, to the presenters and to Margarita who moderated it. And I think it's been very important and thoughtful discussions. So uh, forward look, uh, looking forward to seeing you again. And we uh, intend to continue with this uh, webinars, uh, kind of webinar arenas on personal centric care. And, but there will be the next one will be following the new year um, uh, later on. So take care, everyone, and um, let's stay together and in, in contact. Thanks, to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.